Join us as we dive into the history, hauntings, and high strangers of the world to try to better understand the paranormal. I will be your guide. I am paranormal researcher and investigator Eric Freeman Sims. Welcome to the Unseen Paranormal Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Today we have an awesome guest for you, but before we get there, let's do a little housekeeping here. Please go rate and review the Unseen Paranormal Podcast. If you listen on Spotify or Amazon, I would greatly appreciate it. The more rates and reviews that we get, uh, the more people find the show, and it uh, it goes up in the rankings and all that good stuff. So if y'all would please go do that, that would be great. Also, if you haven't checked out the new podcast that I'm narrating, different true stories from true crime to paranormal, cryptid encounters, things like that, go check out Strange Chapters. It is available anywhere you listen to this podcast. Also available on YouTube. Uh, some of the episodes have a video component to them. So go check that out, and please subscribe to that page and like us on Facebook on Strange Chapters. So with the housekeeping out of the way, let's get to this week's episode. This week we have author William C. Grave on the show. His book is The Lady in the Bay Window, a true story of a haunted Sheffield home. He is over in the U.K. and has lived in this haunted house for uh, going on 19 years. And uh, in his book, he chronicles all the crazy things that have happened over the years to him and his friends and people seeing apparitions and things. So. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you for tuning in. Hey, Will, thanks for coming on the show today and chatting about your new book. No problem. Thank you for having me, Eric. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I uh, actually saw a post you did on Facebook uh, talking about having your new book out that is actually about a house that you have owned for the past 20 years and still own and live in. And uh, I love these personal stories, especially when people write books, because it, it's coming from the actual person it happened to. And, you, you know, in your book, you kind of go year by year, which I think is pretty awesome, too, in a chronological order. And you put yep. all your friends and family's experiences in there. And I just love the way that it's set up like that. And it's always nice to talk to the people that the things actually happen to. And the fact that you still own the house, too. Yeah. Yeah. I might well, I'm actually sat in the house now as I'm talking to you as well. So if you hear any strange noises in the background, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> but as you've read from the book, I'm, I'm quite a... Uh, I'm quite a skeptic, or at least I was until I purchased the house. It's coming up to 19 years in December, um, and there's there's just too many things that have gone on as as you'll you'll read in there that are just weird and wonderful um, that can't be explained. Yeah. So as a logical person, I try to explain everything. I can't explain a lot of the things that are in the book. I'm, I call myself a skeptical believer because I've seen lots of yeah. things, but at the same time, I still try to stay skeptic because. Yeah. You know, when we go into location, I don't want to completely just jump to everything's paranormal. And so if we can, you know, if you can explain it away by the wind or the house creaking or something like that, you know, then then I want to go there first instead of just trying to say everything's paranormal. Definitely. And I think that's that's the way you've got to go about it. And hopefully I've, I've brought that across well in the book as well, that everything, I mean, after every single story, there's sort of a uh, a chapter from myself uh, to show you what my sort of beliefs are and what I think think happened during this story because a lot of the stories as you, as you can see aren't aren't actually about me i think there's only about, about five stories in there that actually are about me and, and my experiences in the house the rest are about family and friends that have lived here throughout the years yeah i like um, how i like how you do that commentary at the end of each chapter um yeah. kind of giving a little more insight but also I, th I think you did a really good job of letting the reader make up their own mind of what's going on yeah. by explaining everything in details and things and not telling anybody how to believe. Yeah, exactly. I'm not trying to turn anyone into a believer or into a skeptic either way. It is, it's sort of out there. They can sit on the fence and go whichever way they wish with each story that's in there. Um, and there's 25 short stories in there of things that have happened, as you mentioned, in, in chronological order throughout the book, um, leading right up until I think the last one was in May um, of this year. So, yeah, it's... Uh, there's, there's some freaky stories in there, as you, as you probably read. Yeah, yeah. There's some incredible experiences that um, you ended up having and your friends. And uh, let's let's start at the beginning. So you bought this yeah. house when you were 19. Which Yeah, so I was, I was 19 years old at the time. Um, very fresh-faced. Uh, and I was working in car sales at the time, which back then you, you could earn quite a, a pretty penny for selling cars back then. Um and I didn't know what to do with the money. And I had a fiance at the time who kind of told me, you need to put this into buying a house. Um, so we, we searched locally in Sheffield. I'm, I'm from Sheffield originally in the UK, in England. 
And we searched locally to where my mom and dad lived and we found a house just up the road. And basically I purchased that in November, 2004. Um, and about a week before I was getting the keys to move into the house, it was Christmas time at this stage. It had gone into December and the everything had gone through for the house. And they invited me to uh, a Christmas do through work, so sort of a Christmas party. And a good friend of mine came to pick me up from my mom and dad's house. And he pulled up outside and said, uh, "Did Will, did you manage to buy the house? Did you did you purchase the house you were talking about? I said, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm getting the keys in about a week's time. And he said, oh, whereabouts is it? I said, it's just around the corner. It's sort of five minutes drive away from my mom and dad's house. So he drove up around the corner. And I said, it's just down this road here. So as we pulled down the steep hill, it was pitch black, very cold December night. And he pulled up on the left-hand side of the road. We sit on a different side of the car to you guys. So I was on the passenger side of the of the car. And I looked up to my left-hand side and said, it's this one here. And he parked up bang outside the house. It's a very quiet road. And I pointed up at the house and said, it's that one there. And he sort of looked up across. He sort of leant across me and, and looked up at the house on a steep hill and said, uh, who's, the, who's the lady in the window? It's a nice house, but who is that lady in the window? And I kind of looked at him and, and did a double take. And I looked back at the house and I looked up at the window. I couldn't see anybody in the windows. Now, I knew that the house had been empty for six months. Um, there's no furniture in the house. There's no carpets down or anything like that. No curtains up even in the windows. And I looked again and said, there's, there's nobody there. And he said, no, there's a lady in the window. And we sort of deliberated about this for a couple of minutes. And then he drove off. And as we were driving down the road, I sort of quizzed him on this and just said, uh, were, you, were you winding me up? Was that a joke um, about the lady? He said, no, I could see a lady in the window. I said, well, what does this lady look like then? And he said she, she was sort of in a sort of 80-year-old, I would say, sort of grey, short hair. She had a, a cardigan on, a dark-coloured cardigan and a white blouse. And she was leaning with both arms in the bay window, sort of staring down at us like she didn't want us to be parked outside her house. Um, and I, I didn't think much of it, Eric, at the time. As I said, I was a, a huge sceptic, never been a huge believer in anything yeah. um, like spiritual or anything. And at the time, I was 19 years old. I just sort of shrugged it off and, and left it at that. Now, I moved into the house a week later. My fiance at the time didn't want to move in without any carpets in the house. She said, I'm not moving in until we've got furniture and carpets and everything else. And myself being quite a, a giddy <laughs> young 19-year-old, I just wanted to get the keys and get in there and have a beer with the boys. Um, so I went to the estate agents and got the keys to the house. And I drove down to the house um, first day, parked up, got the keys in my hand, walked up to the house, very excited, um, walked in, and I was greeted by uh, quite quite a tall gent. I could hear some rummaging around happening in the house, and there was a quite a big bald-headed man, quite muscular, walked towards me, and I said, oh, hello, um, who are you? <laughs> and, I, and he said, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm Nick, I... Uh, I, I'm the previous owner. I bought this house and I bought it for my mom and did it up a little bit. And uh, basically, she uh, he stepped to one side and she was stood behind him. And this uh, little old lady sort of looked at me and said, yeah, I only lived here for a couple of months. So I just couldn't get on with the house. Um, she just said, there's, there's something not right about it. Yeah. And I looked at, I looked at her and I could tell how she, she did look concerned. Um, and Nick sort of bellowed, bellowed out from behind her, mother, don't, don't scare the lad. It's his first house. And, and they made a sharpish exit out of the house. And I invited all the boys around to come around and have a drink with me. Now they turned up later that day in the droves in taxis and pulled up with a crate of beer under one arm and a sleeping bag or a quilt and, and pillow under the other, because I'd basically said to them, come around, we'll have a drink. Um, I've not set up my TV or anything yet, so we'll we'll play Monopoly. Um, <laughs> we'll see the night in, in style in the first first night in the house. Yeah. Um, we all sat around in the front room, and it was on the old oak sort of wooden floorboard. It's a 1930s house, and you could see where the the old rug used to lay in the middle of the room, where they'd sort of just varnished around the rug. And we sat right in the middle of the room. Six of us sat around the board game. We were playing for about two hours, and a few beers had been drunk, and 
hotels had started popping up on the board. Um, and a good friend of mine, Greg, who's uh, quite, again, he's, he's quite a stocky looking kid. He similar sort of, age, well, he was the same age as me. We met when we were 11 years old at school um, and he was sat across from me. Now in, in the front room, the quite high ceilings in these houses um, and literally in that front room there's two doors there's a door into the kitchen there's a door to the bottom of the stairs to the hallway before you go up the stairs and there's a little alcove in the corner of the room now bear in mind there's no furniture there's just six guys sat around a circle around a monopoly board yeah and i watched him he was sat banging across from me and i watched him look over his shoulder and then just freak out he jumped across the board he knocked everyone's drinks over and he sort of scarpered into the corner of the room and, and he tucked his legs up into his chest and grabbed his legs and he, he went pale. His eyes were bulging out of his head. He looked terrified about something. Um, there was there was a lot of commotion because there were drinks spilt everywhere and I, I kind of went, what the hell's going on? And yeah. I sat down with him and said, what's what's happened? What's happened? And, and he couldn't speak. And I sort of picked him up off the floor and said, just come with me into the kitchen a second. Like, get out of the commotion. What's And I, I asked him what had happened. And Greg looked me in the face and said, uh, did, did you not see her? I was like, who? He said, the, the lady, there was a lady sat in the corner of the room. She was sat on, there wasn't even a chair there. It was like an invisible chair. She was just sat staring at me. Now, he doesn't know the guy who from my work who had pulled up outside the house a week before. Yeah. Who described seeing the old lady in the top window. And Greg was, I mean, Craig, sorry, the guy who pulled up outside was a work colleague, didn't know Greg, never met him before. So there's no way that they could have sort of spoke, their, told their stories to each other and done anything to sort of play a practical joke or anything like that. And, and I could see from the fear in his eyes that he'd seen something. And I stood with him and said, just, just describe to me what this lady looked like. And he said she was probably in her 80s, grey hair, grey short perm, a real piercing stare. She was staring right at me. And she had a cardigan on, dark cardigan, white blouse, and a long sort of dark dressy um, skirt of some kind. And he, he described her in detail to me. And this guy, like, I mean, I've known him since I was 11. There's no reason for him to lie to me. Right. And he's not that good of an actor <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to put this on. So... I kind of put two and two together on the first night in the house that there was something weird going on. And it was just, I mean, since then, there's been four different people who've seen the same old lady um, five times between them, and all four people didn't know each other. So could not have told each other about the stories or or known of any of it. So it's just, a, it's, <laughs> it's a bit weird. It's probably yeah. the best way to put it. There's definitely something going on. I just don't know what. And I, I've not seen the old lady. I have seen shadows. I've seen. I've had a coin thrown at me, as you've read in the book. Yeah. Um, I've seen things that, with my own eyes, that cannot happen, cannot logically happen. Door handles turning, that sort of thing. Lights staying on that aren't plugged in. All sorts of things like that that just cannot happen, but are happening in this house, and they are still happening till today. Yeah, and with the coin thing, I found that fascinating because it wasn't even a British coin. No. It, it's no. an American penny. Yeah. I can talk you through that if you like, Eric. It was yeah. uh, That was the last story that I wrote about in the book. Now, I'd been writing the book for uh, – sorry. I, it was just be, before I started writing the book, I was sat in my living room. Now, I started writing the book because my mom was diagnosed um, with a terminal cancer uh, five years ago. And for the first sort of two years, I'd, I felt pretty helpless. So I was doing a lot of sponsored dog walks just to raise money for local cancer charities. Um, and I'd raised about £3,000 um, doing these dog walks and things. And then I had to go in for an operation on my leg. Now, the, the operation was quite a serious one, and it, it meant that I was my dog walking days were over um, for the time being. Yeah. So... At the time, I was pretty depressed that I couldn't help out and do anything to sort of help the cause what my mother was going through. So I was laid on the sofa one one Sunday afternoon, and uh, two good friends of mine, one of which is called Doug in the book. So I've changed all the names in the book just because of the uh, because of the events of what's happened in the house. I've had to change the address and everybody's names and things like that. So uh, 
keep a bit of anonymity <laughs> in there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Doug, who used to live in the house, he always asked me if anything weird's happened. And there's always a creepy story, something that's happened over the past couple of months. It doesn't happen all the time. I would say it probably happens every two, three months. We have about a week or two of madness. But he came around to fit some lights. He's an electrician. And he'd been doing some work on, on the front, uh, fitting some lights on the house. And he came in, and I was sat with another friend of mine, Ian, who's also mentioned in the book as well, who uh, is scared to death of this house, by the way. <laughs> um, he will not go upstairs on his own, um, which is quite amusing. Um, but yeah, Doug came in, asked me the question, has anything freaky happened lately? Has anything weird happened? And I said, actually, yeah. Um, sort of about a week ago, um, on the Friday it was, a normal night, my wife now um, had, had gone to bed. We've been married for four years now, We've been together 11 years. She'd gone to bed about half an hour before me, and I'd gone to go up to bed. And as I walked in the bedroom, I looked down on the bedroom floor and saw a strange-looking coin. And as I bent down and picked it up, I realized it was an American one-cent coin. Now, I've been to America before, Eric, Eric a few times, but not for six years. Yeah. Um, so it was strange to see a coin in the middle of the floor anyway, because as most places, everything's pretty much uh, cashless now. So I don't have a lot of coins around the house, right? but especially not American coins. Um, and I picked the coin up. And as I looked at it, it said it was a 2014. I don't know why I looked at the date on it, but I looked at it and it was 2014. And I just woke my wife up and said, is there any reason why there's an American coin on the floor? Like, why would that be there? Didn't think much of it. I put it in my bedside table and I got into bed and went to sleep. Now, on the Saturday night, similar sort of thing. My wife had gone to bed about half an hour before me. Um, I came upstairs. I walked in the bedroom. The same position in the middle of the bedroom carpet, an American one-cent coin. So I bent down like deja vu. I bent down. I picked up the coin. I looked at it. It said 2014 on it, so I assumed it was the same coin. I looked in my top drawer. The coin was missing, so I then thought it must be the same coin. Um and I woke my wife up again, which is probably not the best thing to do two nights on, on in a row. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> so I woke her up, and she was a little bit grouchy, bless her. Um, and she said, why have you woken me up to tell me? I said, well, it's just weird. Why have I just found this in the middle of the floor? Like, have you put that there as a joke or something? And she said, no, why would I do that? Just sort of uh, give it give it here. Like, uh, sorry, no, this this night she didn't. Actually, I put it back on my in my bedside table. It was the third night that I walked upstairs. So Sunday, this was Friday, Saturday, it's happened. Sunday night, I'd hoovered all the house. So I know there's nothing on the floors. Yeah. I was walking up to bed that night. Again, wife had gone to bed just before me. I was watching something on the TV. I put the dogs in bed. I've gone upstairs. And in the center of the staircase, I bent down. I saw a coin. And again, it was an American one cent coin, 2014. I walked in the bedroom this time, pretty excited about it, and said, Unless you're winding me up, I've just found the same coin on the stairs. I checked my bedside table. It was, it must have been the same coin. It wasn't even a bedside table. There's no other coins in that uh, table as well. And I just looked at it and said, what the hell is going on? Why have I just found this again in the middle of the stairs? And she said, you woke me up again. Give me the coin. Um, and she grabbed the coin off me and she put it over her side of the bed, which is over the far side of the room in the bay window, pretty much, where the the old lady had been seen yeah she put, put the coin on that side of the bed and that night i went to bed googling why am i finding american one cent coins in my home in the uk and the majority of the consensus was that uh it means that some it was a lot of spiritual people saying that somebody is coming to visit you from america the weird thing was that one of my best friends who lived here for about four he rented a room here for about four years he lives in, in santa monica now and he was coming to visit me the following week with his new American girlfriend. Uh, they hadn't been here for three, four years, and they were coming the following week. So I kind of thought, well, that's that's quite weird that I've Googled this, and it does say that it's going to be somebody visiting from, from America. Yeah. But the, sto the story got a little bit stranger, because the next morning I woke up, and I walked around the bed, and I picked up my towel off the radiator, and I went to go into the the shower, which is a sort of bath shower, so I stepped into the bath, I was having a shower, and I was, I was thinking about the coin and why I kept finding this coin. And as I'm thinking about it, 
I felt something hit me quite hard on the back of the calf and it sort of made a slapping noise as it hit me. And before I even looked down, I knew it was going to be the coin. And I looked down into the bathtub and there it was, the the, the 2014 American one cent coin. And I picked it up and I wasn't scared. A lot of people think in that situation would probably be a little bit scared that something's just been thrown at them randomly while they're in the shower. Right. This is in broad daylight as well. And I wasn't scared. I was more, wow, that's just happened. And I picked it up. I put my towel back around me. I ran back into the bedroom and spoke to the wife and said, you're not going to believe this. I said, just check on your bedside table. Has that coin gone? And she said, yeah, it's not here. And I went, okay. It's just been thrown at me in the shower. (laughs) And I put it on the bedside table on my side and there were sort of droplets of water around it. I took a photo of it and I said, don't touch it leave it there. I've taken a photo so that I can sort of evidence if it moves again. Yeah. Um, and I went and I was working from home that morning. So I got changed. Um, I actually had to go and finish having a shower because I was halfway through having a shower. So <laughs> I went and had the rest of my shower and then I got changed, um, ready for work, did a couple of teams calls in the morning. And when I'd finished the teams calls, I went downstairs to make a cup of tea, being a, a typical British person. Um, <laughs> And as I walked in the kitchen, made the cup of tea, I phoned my dad because my dad's really interested in the paranormal side of things. And I spoke to him. Uh, he loves it, hearing about all the weird in- instances in the house and things. And I said uh, all about the story about the coins, told him all about it, and then said it had been thrown at me in the shower. And he said, well, where is it now? I said, well, it's, it's still on my bedside table. So I walked upstairs. Uh, he said, go and check if it's still there. See, go and make sure that it's still there. And I walked in the bedroom and I said, yeah, yeah, it's still there. So I've got the phone to my ear. And I went to pick it up. And as I picked it up, there were two American one cent coins. And there was no there was no way that there was two coins there before. Yeah. Uh, I picked it up, the two American one cent coins. And my dad kind of laughed down the phone as I told him. I said, you're not going to believe this. There's two of them here now. Um, and they were dated 2012 and 2014. And I just said to him, I don't understand this. I can't understand how this can happen. Now, if I, if I take you back to me having the conversation with Doug in the front room, this is me telling him a story about the coins. So he's fitting the the final fix on the electrics. This is the following week after all this has happened, and I'm telling him this story. And he was going paler and paler and paler as I was as I was talking <laughs> to him. But he just looked like as white as a sheet by the time I'd finished the story. Yeah, and I said, "What's, what's wrong?" And he said, you're not going to believe this. I said, what, what's happened? And he said, well, when I got home, he said, when, when was I last at your house? And I said, last Sunday, we, you were doing the first fix on the electrics. And he said, okay, well, I got home that Sunday. This was the night before the coin was thrown at me in the shower the next morning. He'd got home that night and passed his trousers to his wife to put them in his work trousers. You know, these work trousers, the pockets down the side with loads of pockets in them. Yeah. He'd, yeah. Give, he'd, he'd given those to his wife to put in the washing machine. And she went to empty the pockets. There was nothing in his pockets at all, apart from a one cent American piece. Wow. And he was freaked. He genuinely thought, he's he's experienced things here in the house. And he genuinely thought that something had followed him home. Um, so he was really freaked out about it. <laughs> but I've, ne- I've now got these three one cent American piece uh, coins all together now in the house. Um, and there's a story actually in the book where I invited a spiritualist medium round to the house and I gave him the coins and there's quite a weird story behind that as well, but I know you've read that. Um, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's just really weird. It's unexplainable. I can't, there is no way. I, I mean, I'll ask you, Eric, there's no way to explain that. Is there? No, no, it's in, in, in the paranormal world, we call it, we call it a, a portation, a porting, okay. a porting objects. And so. Yeah, sometimes you'll get that with hauntings. Um, I've actually had it happen at my house. Uh, my okay. house, I have, a, I have a resident spirit in my house that actually followed me home when I was younger. But uh, okay. that's a completely different story, a Civil War soldier. But um, <laughs> okay. And then my parents have both passed away, and yeah. um, so I have their, I inherited their house. So yeah. they come around, I think they come around every once in a while on visit. Well, last fall, right after uh, Thanksgiving, uh, I think it was the 1st of December, you know, candy corn, like it's a big thing here yeah. in America. Candy corn. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm diabetic, so I don't eat candy. And yeah. so there's no candy in our house. And I have eight dogs. So okay. I say that wow. because if food hits the floor, they're going <laughs> to eat it. You know, it's there's not going to be, you're not going to find any food in the floor. 
Yeah. And um, I was walking through my kitchen and I got hit by a piece of candy corn. Okay. And it hit me in the back and fell on the floor. And I'm like, what in the hell? And nobody, uh, nobody in the kitchen. No, just me. And the dogs were home. I was the only one home. And I'm like, what? Where did that come from? Yeah. Like, you know, but my mom loved candy corn. Okay. And so I just kind of was like, okay, hey, mom. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> her just saying, hey. But yeah, I've had the. Yeah, a piece of candy corn of anything. But yeah, in the paranormal world, yeah, we call that a porting. Spirits a port things. And that also includes them like uh, people will report spirits moving things around, like their keys will be in the freezer or something, you know, um, weird things like that. You've had a couple of other poltergeist type things happen as well in the house. Um, yeah. The one story I found really interesting, you had a female friend of yours, because just to let the audience know, throughout the years, you have a three bedroom house and you, yes. throughout the years, people have rented the other two rooms from you when you were most of the time yeah. when you were single and didn't have anybody living with you. And you yeah. had a female friend rent one of the rooms and something crazy happened. Probably the craziest yeah. thing. Yeah. This, this was probably one of the scariest things for me, I think, in, in the book. And yeah. again, I don't, I don't know if this is paranormal. I'll tell you the story, but I don't know if it was paranormal or not. Um, but it, it, it kind of, it's weird. So just to let you know, yeah, it was a friend of a friend, a lady who was looking for a place to live. At the time I was single, there was nobody else living here. And I offered her to come and live here. And I used to love to throw a, a bit of a house party. So it was any excuse to have a house party. And I basically invited everybody around one Saturday night. We had a great party and then it got to silly hours in the morning. It was probably three in the morning. And I started to call taxis for everybody. Now, one of the guys called Seth, who was kind of a friend of a friend, but we mixed in the same circles. He said, do you mind if I stay? Do you mind if I stay on the sofa and call a cab in the morning? Um, and I said, yeah, that's, that's no problem with me. And myself, and the lady who was living here basically went to our separate rooms upstairs. We tidied up a little bit and then went to our separate rooms upstairs. Now, I'd said to Seth as I left the room and turned all the lights and things off, I just said, look, the keys are in the back of the door when you get up in the morning. Because he'd said he had work at sort of dinner time. I said, when you get up in the morning, don't wake me up because I'll probably be hung over. Um, <laughs> yeah. just, just let yourself out the door, leave the keys in the back of the door. It's fine. Um, I'll sort it when I get up. So the next morning, I heard at nine o'clock, I heard a black cab, like the black London cabs that we get over here, pull up outside because they're quite noisy. And I heard Seth leave the house. Now I heard him slam the door shut and the keys jangled the back of the door as he slammed the door shut. Now about two hours later, so it's about 11 o'clock, I arose from my bed with quite a bad hangover, a bit of a headache, a lady living in the house now. So I just put a, a few bits of clothes on before I started walking around the house um, and I walked down the stairs, and as I sort of looked up, uh, holding my head, um, I saw that the door was left ajar, the front door. Now, I'd heard it. I heard the door close at 9 o'clock, but it wasn't locked. So this is where I'm saying this could it could not be paranormal, but right. you make your own mind up on this one. So I walked to the door. I thought, oh, no, somebody's broke into the house. I've left the door unlocked, and somebody's broke in. Now, it's quite a nice neighborhood I live in. So nothing, I've never touched wood. I've never had anything like that happen. Nobody's ever broken into the house or, or tried, attempted or anything like that. So I opened the door and as I looked outside, I could see uh, the lady's handbag who was living with me now was just strewn out across the path at the top. Of, it's quite a steep path up to the house and it flattens out where the front door is. And the contents of her handbag was all across the floor. There was a packet of cigarettes, um, there's a phone in there, loads of makeup, all sorts of stuff was just thrown across the floor. And I thought, oh, no, I've, I've definitely been robbed. But yeah. then thought to myself, well, why would they not take the contents of a bag? Their purse was in there. Why would they not take the contents? Anyway, I, I ran upstairs and I grabbed hold of her and said, you need to come downstairs quickly. Um, I think somebody's robbed the house. And she looked at a bag outside and I helped her pick up the contents of it. And I said, is there anything missing? She said, no, weirdly, everything's still here. I said, okay, that's strange. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind at this point, I've not been through the door into the front room to check if my TV's still there, if anything else is still there. Uh, my car was still there, which is good. Um, but as we walked back into the front room, I sort of opened the door anxiously thinking, oh my God, what's going to be missing here? And I looked up and saw probably the scariest thing that I've seen in the house. There were five 
um, sort of chef's knives that were plunged into the floor. And it was right across the foot of the door that goes to the kitchen. So we had sand, I'd sanded down the original oak floorboards and these knives were stuck in in size order, probably about two inches each into the floor. And some of these knives were eight inches tall, I would say, eight inches big. Yeah. Um, they were two inches into the floor, like driven in. Wow. But they were all evenly spaced across the threshold of the door to the kitchen. And I sort of looked at the, the lady who moved in and just said, uh, um, what the hell is this about? Um, and I just said to her, you stay here a second. I'm going to go around the rest of the house and make sure there's nobody in the house. So I walked into the kitchen. And as I walked in the kitchen, there were two cupboard doors that were wide open. And the cutlery drawer was wide open. The knife block on the side where the five knives had come from, they were my knives, by the way. Um, the five knives were out of the uh, the block, the knife block. That was on the side. That was empty. Obviously, they were in the floor. Um and I walked around the rest of the house, shaked every single room in there. There's nobody in the house. Yeah. Now, at the time, it was time before ring doorbells and before I'd had CCTV fitted on the house as well. So I don't know. I leave this to interpretation to you guys is, did somebody walk in the house on a Sunday morning of all mornings and do that in the two hours where the front door was unlocked and I was comatose to sleep in bed? Or did something paranormal happen? Yeah. I genuinely don't know. And I leave that to interpretation of whoever whoever reads the book. What are your thoughts on that, Eric? It just seems weird that you, because especially the knives driven in the floor. Oh, they were, and I mean, they were they were thick and they were two inches into them. I, I, it, was right. like, it was like sword in the stone trying to hold them out the floor. <laughs> yeah. they, were, they were deep into the floor. It seems like you would have heard that, you know? I mean, yeah. the force that it would take into the wood floor that you would hear. Yeah. I mean, wood floors you can hear somebody walking really easily so you yeah. know somebody driving five knives in the floor that deep it seems yeah. like you would have heard it if it was a person mm -hmm. um and also like you said they didn't take anything now i don't understand why somebody would come in your house and do that and then walk away without taking anything um, right I mean, my car keys were on the side at the bottom of the stairs they could have taken my car yeah that was still there so it seems, it seems like the way you talk about the neighborhood in the book it wasn't like a bad neighborhood or anything i mean you live in a pretty good neighborhood yeah, it's a good neighborhood. Um, that's why I've stayed here so long, to be fair. Um, people think I'm crazy still living here with what's going on, especially now they've read the book and things. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's a good neighborhood. But like I say, the, the whole thing about the book, the reason why I started writing it was because I was doing all these sponsored dog walks and earning all the, the money side of things. Then I injured my knee and had to have the operation. Once Doug had I told Doug the story about the coins and things, the other chap who was sat there, Ian, turned around and said, you should write about these because they are really interesting stories and people will read it. He said, I, I would read it, definitely. Yeah. Um, I had a bit of a light bulb moment and thought, actually, if I could do this and donate all the money to Cavendish Cancer Care, who had been helping my mom through her treatment and diagnosis and everything, they helped her. They were vital in helping her with the mental side of things, um, of getting through diagnosis and treatment and stuff. And and sadly, my mom didn't get to read the final bit of the book because I, I launched it on October the 31st. Unfortunately, she passed away in May. So um, everything from the book is going to her chosen charity, in effect. Yeah. Sorry to hear about your mom, man. That, that's horrible. Like Thank I said, you, I've dude. lost both my parents, so I completely understand. Yeah, I'm sorry, to hear, I'm sorry to hear that, too. It's awful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's awesome that you're you're doing this amazing thing um, to help this charity out, and you know, not gaining anything out of this book. I mean, I just let everybody know, you know, William C. Grave is not your real name. You use the pen name. No. Everybody's names has changed, like you were saying. You changed the address as well. Yes. And, but just get the story out there, and and uh, because it is an interesting story, and the fact that you had so many people that have had experiences, uh, yeah. you know, lends credibility as well, and in, in that yeah there's crazy stuff going on in your house there is and a lot of the stuff like you say about dip it's all about different people and their experiences in the house and i've had to interview them um and a few of them are still traumatized by it i mean there's a guy yeah. where you you probably read about this guy with this the sofa and the sofa lifted up on one yeah. end um, yeah he hasn't been back to the house in 15 years he literally wow. left the house that day he used to come around two or three times a week he's a good good drinking buddy of mine um and to be honest, I've not seen that much of him since that day. He literally 
freaked and just looked at me and said, that is not normal. I'm leaving. I'm not coming back here. And he left. And it's been 15 years since he stepped foot in this house. I've invited him to come round next month. Um, he's he's going to come round for a drink with me in the house um, and just to relive what happened. That would be quite interesting to to get his thoughts on that again. But, yeah, there's so many times when things have happened where it's not just one person that's witnessed it. There's yeah. there's all the people that have witnessed the same thing happening within the house, which lends itself to saying it is paranormal. Right. And that's coming from me, who was a huge skeptic. So, so yeah, there's a lot of weird things happened. Yeah, and also, I mean, your friends are coming around to hang out and, and have some drinks or watch football or whatever. You know, they're yeah. not coming around to have paranormal experiences. So for these things to happen right in front of their face, like you're talking about yeah. the couch lifting up, there are three of you sitting on it and it lifted up like five or six inches on just one side and slammed back down. Yeah. And it was a big, big couch as well. Yeah. Um, so this this thing was a big, heavy couch and three of us were, were sat on it. We all, all three of us had our feet up at the time as well. So we had it on a sort of poof, we call it, um, yeah. in, in the middle of the room and there's no logical way that can happen. I was one of the people sat on the couch and it lifted at the end I was sat on. So I felt it. I heard the bang as the sofa hit the floor again. And I looked up and saw the face of of one of the guys, Brad, who just looked at me, gone out. Um, He'd seen it happen because I was talking to him at the time it happened. Yeah, He saw it happen and just, like I say, put his jacket on and he was out of there. <laughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't coming back uh, and he stuck to his word. Yeah, it's been that long since he's been there. Yeah, so it'll be funny when he comes back next month. So um, you have a house that's kind of connected to yours? Yes, yeah. Did those neighbors, have you talked to those neighbors about ever having any, anything going on in their house? Yeah, there's there's been, I think there's been four or five sets of neighbors in the, well, I've come up to 19 years that I've lived here. There's been four or five different sets of neighbors that have lived there. Um, I've spoke to all of them bar the couple that's in now um i haven't spoke to them about it yet because they've not been here that long uh <laughs> yeah I don't, I don't want to come across as uh the weird neighbor or anything like that so I, I will probably mention it to them at some stage um the other neighbor down the road when i moved in here there's a, an elderly gentleman who was probably in his 80s late 80s who sadly passed away since and i've referred to him as tezza in the book um yeah. I did speak to him and there's a, there's a chapter written about speaking with him about the history of the house and who lived here before. So that the house was built on March the 25th, 1936. It is, as you mentioned, it's a semi-detached house. So it's attached to another three bed uh, house next door. But these buildings are old buildings that are built very well with big thick walls. So you can't hear anything from next door. It's very hard to hear anything from any other rooms. So to hear noises like footsteps and things upstairs, they have to be loud footsteps. Right. And, and we hear them a lot. And we also hear doorknobs turning and things. So we, we, if you pause the television, you can hear these things happening. When when we have this week or two of madness, which we had a, a couple of weeks back, to be fair, it just seems to be a hotbed of supernatural activity happening in the house for a week or two. It's crazy. Yeah, that's kind of what I've noticed in my own house. It'll kind of ramp up for a little while, and then it comes back down. Like, they're almost, I don't know, yeah. like they have to recharge their batteries. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of how it feels. That's exactly how it feels here. I mean, when it did ramp up a few weeks ago, we had something we've never had before, which was really weird and quite creepy, to be fair. Um, I woke up at about 7 o'clock. Bear in mind, I've just had, we've got a little boy now who's um, he's downstairs at the minute with my dad. My dad sees granddad's looking after him. Uh, while well, we're on the call. Um, he's six months old now. Um, but a couple of weeks ago, seven o'clock in the morning, I woke up, my wife was asleep next to me, and the little one was asleep in his cot next to her. And I got woke up at seven o'clock by the sound of a xylophone. Now, it was quite a distinctive sound. Yeah. Now, bear in mind, I don't have a xylophone. Um, I don't <laughs> have a xylophone, and there's not one in the house. We do have some kiddies' toys and things, but not a xylophone, um, yeah. but playing quite a playful melody. Now, I sort of sat up out of bed, and th my first thought was, being the logical person, have I left my, my phone on from the night before listening to a podcast or something like that? Right. So I checked my phone. My phone battery was dead. I checked my work phone. My work phone was just, it was on silent, but there was nothing playing on there. 
I walk around the other side of the bed and I check my wife's phone. There's nothing on that. But as I walk around the other side of the bed, I realised the music was coming from my side of the bed and it was coming from the wardrobe. So I walk back over and sort of really sort of uh, rubbing my head thinking, what the hell is this noise? And it was still playing this playful tune. Now, if you're into the paranormal side of things, you've probably seen quite a few horror movies that have sort of playful children's music on. So I was a little bit... (laughs) A little bit apprehensive about opening the wardrobe. Um, and bear in mind, this wardrobe, it's a shared wardrobe with my wife. I say shared. Basically, she she has the majority of it. I have a little bit <laughs> of this wardrobe. And I went to open the, the doors. There's nothing in there but clothes. And as I opened the doors, the music stopped almost immediately. Now, this same thing happens when every time we investigate any noises around the house, it stops when you go to investigate it. So you could be downstairs and hear things upstairs. If you go upstairs, it'll stop. And vice versa, if you hear things downstairs, you go and investigate, it stops. It's like it knows you're coming or whatever. It wants your attention, then it stops. Yeah. But yeah, this xylophone noise stopped. So I've got both doors, sort of one door in each hand. And as I stood there, this was the bit that freaked me. There was a noise in my left ear, like someone was stood by next to me, and they made like a guttural sort of like a coughing sound, like a smoker's cough, like a <laughs> sort yeah. of noise right in my left ear. And there's nobody there. My wife was asleep in bed, baby's asleep, and I froze. I mean, the, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I froze. Not a lot of things in this house have scared me. That did, because it literally felt like someone stood next to me. I looked around, there's nobody there. Um, I woke my wife and said, Grace, Grace, did you please tell me you've just heard that? And she just looked at me and said, what's happened? And I had to explain to her what had happened. Um, And I was really creeped out by that, to be fair. And this was only two weeks ago. The following morning on the Wednesday, when you say about your house, when it's recharging the batteries and it's all kicking off again, the following day, Wednesday morning, similar sort of time, seven o'clock in the morning, my wife woke me up. She was shaking me awake saying, there's something growling at the end of the bed. Now we, like you, we've we've got two dogs. We've not got eight, <laughs> but we've, <laughs> we've, we've got two little dogs, but they sleep downstairs. They're not allowed upstairs. They sleep downstairs and they're very happy down there and they don't make a lot of noise. This growl apparently was coming from the end of the bed. I didn't hear it, so I didn't witness this, um, yeah. but she, she did make me get up and go and look at the end of the bed to see if anything was there, which inevitably was nothing there. The Thursday, so that was Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday morning, uh, I woke up again, similar sort of time, to the xylophone noise, it was back. And I woke my wife up, and we both witnessed this at the same time. We both heard the xylophone. She said, that is weird. Where is yeah. that coming from? And I stood up out of bed, and I, I walked to the door, and I listened to, it was coming from the door to the landing, to the sort of hallway at the top of the stairs, where we've heard footsteps so many times over the years. Um, and I opened the door, and as I opened it, it stopped again. And then on the Friday, my wife went down to make the baby's bottle first thing in the morning. She heard the xylophone in the kitchen. like it, She said it was like it was playing next to her, oh. but there's nothing there. Yeah. Um, and she came upstairs really freaked out without the baby's bottle as well and sent me back down to go and get the baby's <laughs> bottle. She was so freaked out. Like, yeah. like I, said, I, I don't really get scared by these things very often. Um, my wife, on the other hand, hates it. She re- it really creeps her out. Um, but yeah, on the on the Sunday, this is sort of where it, it built up to on a Sunday. I was laying on the sofa, a uh, little six-month-old baby on my chest. Both dogs were laid, sort of curled up by my feet. And my wife was upstairs. Um, she'd had a little bit too much to drink the prior night, and she would uh, <laughs> she was a little bit hungover, so she was in bed. Um, and she was fast asleep upstairs. So... I'm laid on the sofa. It's only about nine o'clock at night, but with it being uh, sort of autumn, winter time, it's quite dark um, at that time over here. And I could hear the door handle at the bottom of the stairs rattling. And it's a, it's like, a to describe this to you, it's a spring-loaded door handle. Yeah. So you imagine you have to put your hand on it and pull it down to then open the door. I could hear it rattling. So I paused the television and this rattling sound got louder and louder until the door was actually like rattling uh, on its hinges sort of thing. It's weird. And then the door handle sort of snatched down a little bit, and then the whole noise stopped. But the dogs went mad. Now, the dogs don't often sense things around the house, but they went absolutely crazy at the door and were trying to sort of scratch to get to the door. 
I jumped up with a little one on my chest, walked up to the door, opened the door straight away. There's nothing there, just a, an empty hallway and staircase. Yeah. In dark. I walked upstairs, checked on my wife. She was fast asleep in bed. The front door was locked. There's no windows open. It's cold over here this time of year. Yeah. There's definitely no windows open. There's no explanation for that. That is weird. And that was the last thing that happened of the sort of week of madness, if you like. And then it stopped. I've not had anything since uh, since that. But it'll be, it'll, it'll be back. <laughs> yeah. I've heard people that I've talked to before in your particular type situation where they've those things ramp up when they do podcasts or they do interviews. Have you noticed any of that with having the book out? We did. I did a podcast. Um, there's been quite a few things happened when I launched the book. It almost as if something new. I was talking about it at the time. Um, now I launched the book on Halloween of all days as well. Um, yeah. Mainly because it was the end of the month. It, it just coincided. It was Halloween and I'd finished it and it was ready to publish at that time. And I thought, Payday is normally the end of the month for everybody, so it's probably the best day to do it. <laughs> right. um, but it, it coincided with Halloween, which was great as well. But yeah, things did hot up a little bit. Um, the the first thing that happened was the day after, um, I believe it was the day after Halloween, I, had, I have something called sleep paralysis. Now, I don't know if you've heard of this before, Eric. Yeah. I've never had sleep paralysis before I lived in this house. Now, Sleep paralysis, just to explain to anybody who doesn't understand that, is basically when your your mind wakes up before your body. So your body stays asleep and paralyzed, if you like. You can't even open your eyes or your mouth or anything. The only thing you can do is try and control your breathing. Now, when I first start to get sleep paralysis, I I used to panic. I used to pretty much go into a panic attack because you don't know how to get out of it. You're sort of stuck inside your own body. It's weird. Um then I, I realized, oh, all I need to do is control my breathing until this goes away, which tends to go away. I would have said within minutes, but it feels like hours. Um, yeah. But once uh, my, my wife, Grace, knew about this sleep paralysis thing, I basically said to her, to wake me up out of it, just give me a little sort of tap on the face. Um, don't take advantage and slap me. <laughs> <laughs> just give me a little tap on the face and, and I'll wake up and that'll be all good. So it has happened. Very rare that I get it, but it's normally when I'm overtired, overworked, and uh, a bit stressed. You tend to get this sleep paralysis come creeps back, and I start to get it again. Now I've not had it for a long time, and I think building up to the book coming out, I've been working on so many things to make sure it's perfect before it, it got out there. I, yeah. th- I probably was a little bit stressed and a little bit overtired. And one particular night, I'd fallen asleep on the sofa with the dogs. Uh, wife had gone to bed, I'd fallen asleep on the sofa, and I was facing the wall, so one of the dogs was sort of cuddled up on me, one, one on my feet, one by my chest, and I'd fallen asleep, and I knew straight away that I'd gone into sleep paralysis mode, and I was trying to control my breathing. I'm sort of thinking in my mind at this point, I need to control my breathing and last this out, because my wife isn't here to give me a quick tap on the face to wake me up, and as I'm thinking that, I hear footsteps behind me in the front room. Now, they were heavy footsteps. These didn't sound like my wife's footsteps. These were big, heavy footsteps. These are ones that I've heard before in the house. Yeah. And they started behind me sort of slowly coming from the bottom of the stairs and then got closer and closer to me. And as they got closer to me, they got faster as well, like someone was running up behind me. And then the next minute, I felt some a prod in my back, like on my shoulder, right in the center of my shoulder blade. Now, if you if you're sat there now, if you try and reach your shoulder blade with your hand, there's a there's a point on your shoulder blade where you can't reach, or I can't anyway. Yeah. Um, it was right there, and I felt it, and it woke me up, and I jumped up off the sofa. It's pitch black. I put the light on and thought that actually hurt a little bit. And I'm six foot four. I'm quite a biggish lad, <laughs> but it hurt a little bit. So I went upstairs, and we've got quite a big. Um, big mirror at the top of the stairs and I took my shirt off and I looked at myself in the mirror turned around and there's a red mark on my shoulder blade now there's nobody in the room there's nobody in the room with me both doors were closed to the front room to the stairs to the kitchen the the doors were closed there's nobody in that front room with me the dogs couldn't have done it Um, one of them was in front of me one of them was on my feet I I can't explain how that happened but I felt I, I managed to somehow go back to sleep because my thoughts were it could be one of two things, Eric. It's either a spirit in the house that wanted to wake me up from sleep paralysis. Yeah. Or it's 
a bit more sinister. <laughs> um, it's one or the other. So right. I managed to get myself back to sleep on the sofa. I didn't want to wake the wife up, so I got back to sleep on the sofa. And the next morning I went upstairs and started taking my clothes off to get ready to go in the shower ready for work. And my wife looked at me and said, oh, my God, what have you done to your bag? I said, well, what's what's wrong? And I'd, I'd sort of blanked it out, I think. I think I'd blanked out the fact of what happened the night before. And I went and looked in the mirror, and there was a bruise, like a perfect circular, really deep black bruise right in the middle of my shoulder blade, like somebody had got their index finger and sort of stabbed me with it as hard as they could in the shoulder. Yeah, It was very... Uh, sort of pronounced on my shoulder blade. And I went in and told her what, what had happened. And she was a bit freaked out, to be fair. Um, but yeah, that was like a day after I'd, I'd launched the book. Yeah, I think uh, just from my experiences um, in the paranormal for, you know, 20 some years, I, I think they they don't mean to scratch and things like that. Um, yeah. I think they don't they don't have any control over that power. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it's all it's yeah. all or nothing. And I think it sounds to me like they're trying to be more helpful to you by getting you out of the sleep paralysis. Yeah, exactly. That's, it could be either way. That's exactly what yeah. I thought. That's why I didn't let it sort of freak me out. I thought if there's somebody that was trying to get me out of sleep paralysis, then fair play to them because I hate being in it. Um, yeah. There's, not, yeah. there's no way out of it without somebody sort of tapping me. Yeah. And just, I mean, just looking at the history of the house, I mean, nothing really sinister other than a few jump scares, you know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the the lady who lived here from the she lived here from nineteen March the twenty fifth, nineteen thirty six. Um, it was actually a council house. I don't know if you have these over in the states, but basically means the government um sort of fund the house if you like. But she was a, she was a furrier. I found out from the neighbor next door, the elderly neighbor who sadly passed away. He told me all about her, and I've named her Mrs. Tompkins in the book. Obviously, I had to change the name for that one as well. Yeah. Um. But uh, it was quite a similar name to that, but named her Mrs. Tompkins. She was a furrier, which is basically somebody who makes fur coats. So she yeah. had quite a posh quite a posh job, if you like, when she was around. Um, and she lived in here up until so six months before I purchased the house. So she, she'd had the house from it being new. She did have a partner. Uh, which lived lived with her as well, and we do know that he died in the house. I don't know how, but I do know that he died in the house. We don't know if Mrs. Tompkins actually died in the house, but she certainly owned the house when she died. Yeah. Um, so she may have died in hospital or elsewhere, but she certainly owned the house when she died. But yeah, the the lady of the house, I don't think appears that sinister Yeah, from everything that I'm hearing from. We've had a medium here. I've had a ghost investigation team here that you, you will have read about in the book. Yeah. Um, I've written a chapter on both of those. The they basically said that the lady's quite a nice lady. Um, she just likes to be seen. It's her home. She loves the home. Um, there is her partner, who they both picked up that she had a partner and she wasn't married, um, which is correct, but historically correct. Um, he seems a little bit more sinister. And the reason why they were saying he's sinister is because he wants to find his wife. He's trying to find his wife and he can't find her. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's definitely the cough that I've heard. It's not the first time I've heard that cough that was in my ear um, the other week. That is definitely a, a male cough. And the footsteps that I hear are 100% sound like, I know this sounds weird to say they're male footsteps, but it sounds like a very heavy set male figure walking around. Right, more like like boots or something like that. Yeah, like big, big boots. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite a heavy, heavy noise. Yeah, it's uh, strange, very strange going on. Yeah, I would say after reading the stories, just my first take, without you know ever investigating the house or anything, would be that you know maybe she just comes in a visit from time to time, and maybe he's stuck there, you know, of his own of his own accord. I don't yeah. think he's stuck there, can't yeah. move on. I think he's just stuck there of his own accord because, like you said, he's looking for her or his wife and can't find her, and so um, he's kind of. Yeah. But it sounds like she just pops in from time to time. She likes people to see her when she pops in. <laughs> you know. yeah it does to be fair yeah if, if you've read the book that's yeah. exactly what it sounds like um i don't know what i get about the i mean you've read the book about the when the medium came and he mentioned there was a vortex in the bedroom i don't know much about these i've tried to read up a lot about them online it sounds like a spirit porthole yeah. or something like that 
do you know more, much more about them than, yeah. than that? Because I didn't really ask yeah. those questions to the medium on the day. Um, there, there's been a few places where I would say there's probably some kind of portal. They yeah. typically are places where like horrible things happen. Like here in the States, uh, a few of the places I've been, um, that I would say that, that definitely have a portal or places where like horrific civil war things happen and things like that, you know, just yeah. your normal house where this lady lived for 80 years. I don't think it's going to, there's no reason for it to have a portal. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, for, for transient yeah. smears come in and out. I think if there was you'd have a lot more activity than you do now. Uh, probably have a lot more nasty yeah. things come through as well. Cause those typically just let kind of any spirits come through. Yeah. And, yeah. and as far as um, it, you can also with, with already having spirit activity in your house and people seeing spirits and you experiencing it, I think you can also have some transient spirits from outside of your house that may be something happened to them close or in another house that may pop in to say, Oh, these yeah. people are already, you know, experiencing the stuff or they see us or hear us or whatever <laughs> to where, you know, whatever house yeah. they're stuck in or whatever, those people are just ignoring them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I get you. I don't think it's going away anytime yeah. soon is the main thing. So people have been asking, am I writing another book after this? Once we've <laughs> enjoyed reading it. Um, I, I have actually now started noting down times and dates as to exactly yeah. when things happened. Um, I've probably got about seven chapters worth of things that I could write about now, but not enough to fill a book. And like you said, it's not happening yeah. all the time. So it's going to take a hell of a lot of long time. I mean, that's 18 years worth of experiences in that book. Don't get me wrong, not all the experiences in there, but I didn't want to write about footsteps every chapter. Right. Um, so, so I've just wrote about the noteworthy things that are in there. But yeah, I can't believe it's managed to get over to the States, the book. It's crazy. Yeah, it's... um. Being in the, that's what I love about all being all over the paranormal community is you can kind of connect with anybody in the world to see their stories and yeah. in, in the books like this, you know, like I said, I, I, I saw you post in a, in a paranormal group that we're both in and, and, uh, yeah. I immediately messaged you like, yes, I want to, you know, are you interested in coming on the show? <laughs> so. Yeah. And look, any publicity for it, like I say, it's all for charity. Right. So any publicity like this is great. And getting to meet, I've met some really interesting people, including yourself along the way. It's been a fantastic journey with it so far, and, and long may it continue. Um, it's raised over six thousand pounds now for charity, and sold fifteen hundred books worldwide as well. So it's it's amazing. Oh wow, that's awesome. That's uh, roughly American, around between eighty five hundred and nine thousand dollars, I believe. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. yeah that's, 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 that's in awesome. two weeks. Two weeks yeah. uh, on Amazon. That's crazy. Yeah, and the absolutely. And the book is called "The Lady in the Bay Window: A True Story of a Haunted Sheffield Home." by William C. Graves, it and it's available on Amazon, Kindle, and you said that you're working on an audio book as well. I am, yeah. You've probably noticed from this I've got quite a bad cold at the minute, so I've put it on hold for a week um, while, I, while I shake this uh, common cold off. But as soon as I've done that, I will get back onto the audio book. I'm hoping to have that done and ready for Christmas. Um, but, yeah, the book's in paperback, hardback, Kindle, Kindle Unlimited. It's it's all across Amazon now, and it's it's actually a bestseller in six categories as well, which is amazing. So thank you for the support of people who bought it already. Um, and if you haven't, please feel free to have a look or find me on Facebook under the lady in the bay window. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And and also it's, it's the ratings are great. You know, it takes a lot to get people to go on Amazon and stuff and rate things. And so the fact that you got 4.9 out of five stars with 144 ratings, is pretty awesome. I'm glad it's number one too, because you know, it's all going to, to a great charity to help people. So. Yeah, it is. It is. It's people have been so supportive of it, and uh, yeah, I can't be can't be more thankful for that. Well, I thank you so much for coming on the show, Will. No, th Eric, thank you ever so much for having me. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure to uh, to meet you. Yeah, it's been it's been a pleasure to to talk to you. And like I said, I love the book. I'll go and and leave a review for sure. Please go check out his book, whether you do it on Kindle Unlimited or buy a copy of it, because like we're saying, all the all of it goes to a really good uh, cancer charity and uh, helping people out. And I guarantee you'll you'll enjoy the book. Part of the reason I liked it is the way you set it up because it's unlike any other kind of haunted house book that I've ever read. And uh, I think it's it's set up just great the way you did chronological order and then kind of the author's notes at the end of each chapter. It's just a great setup. Cool. Thank you ever so much. I really appreciate your feedback. Yeah, and I look forward. I'll I'll, I'll keep an eye out in case you have some another book come out. We'll have you back on the show. Cool. Sounds good to me. Thank you, Eric. All right, Will. Have a great day. Everybody out there, thank you for tuning in. Y'all stay safe out there. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The Unseen Paranormal. Join me next Wednesday with a brand new guest. And please rate, review, share, and subscribe on Apple, 
Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. This helps more people discover the show. You can connect with me over on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or join us in the Unseen Paranormal Lounge group on Facebook. Until next time, remember, some of the scariest things are unseen. To the end of the line